Welcome to the third installment of the ICPVTR webinar series on the terrorism landscape in Southeast Asia. This morning, we are very pleased and honored to have with us two distinguished and very knowledgeable speakers and good friends to share on the topic of four years after Marawi, threat and societal response in the Philippines. Dr. Romel C. Banloi, our first speaker, will be the, is the chairman of the Philippine Institute for Peace, Violence and Terrorism Research, or PIPVTR. He is also professorial lecturer at the Department of International Studies, Miriam College, the Philippines. Our second speaker is Professor Dr. Yusuf Roque Santos Morales, Senior Fellow at the Institute for Comparative and Advanced Studies in the Philippines, and also consultant with the Ateneo de Zambong Anga University in the Philippines. In this third webinar of the Terrorism Landscape in Southeast Asia series, we look at the situation in the Philippines especially in the wake of the 2017 Marawi battle between the armed forces of the Philippines and the pro-ISIS Philippine Islamist extremist militant groups. It is notable that the Philippines is in the top 10 countries in the Global Terrorism Index 2020, published by the Institute for Economics and Peace. Hence, this webinar is certainly timely. Our speakers this morning will provide their own assessments of how the Islamist terrorism and extremism threats in the Philippines have evolved four years after the 2017 Marawi siege. Given that to date, the Philippines has seen five major suicide terrorist attacks involving local operatives and foreign nationals, as well as men and women. We do know that to counter the terrorist threat, the Philippine government is implementing the 2020 anti-terrorism law that also supports the National Action Plan to prevent and counter violent extremism through a whole of government, and I would say even a whole of society approach. Our speakers will provide their assessments of such measures, including the important measure of counter and alternative narratives, as well as their views of the regional threat posed by Philippine threat groups. Each speaker will have about 20 minutes each to make their key points, after Romel and Yusuf complete their presentations, I will moderate the question and answer session. As usual, please send in your questions using the chat box on the right. So with that, uh, over to you, Romel, to get us going. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumara Makisna. I would like to uh, uh, thank ICTBTR for the kind invitation to speak uh, uh, to you today. If, if the truth be known, uh, our institute, Philippine Institute for Peace, Violence, and Terrorism Research benefited a lot from the capacity building program of ICPBTR. So thank you very much for that. And uh, you know, we have been doing this for uh, the past many years uh, uh, in the aftermath of 911. So what I'm going to discuss today is to describe terrorist threats in the Philippines for years after Marawi liberation. And because we are commemorating the 20th year of the 911 terrorist attacks on the United States, I will also discuss uh, uh, 20 years after uh, 911, especially lessons learned after 911. So, for the purpose of my presentation, I will describe the phase of terrorism in the Philippines four years after the Marawi liberation, the lesson learned 20 years after 911, and future prospects by uh, describing persistent and emerging terrorist threats uh, confronting the Philippines. So let me discuss the phase of terrorism in the Philippines four years after Marawi liberation. There's only one uh, uh, concept that I'll describe the phase of terrorism in the Philippines four years after Marawi liberation, and that is suicide terrorism. You know, uh, since the liberation of Marawi in October 2017, the Philippines has experienced five major suicide terrorist attacks involving foreign and Filipino nationals as shown. So I will not uh, uh, describe uh, each uh, attack already. And if you will look at this five suicide terrorist attack, the current phase of terror exhibited several uh, characteristics. We have conjugal suicide terrorism involving husband and wife. We have the uh, recorded Filipino suicide terrorism, female suicide terrorism. And because of the involvement of the family, we have family suicide terrorism. And when it comes to female suicide terrorism, almost 50% of the suicide terrorist attackers were female. And then these are the things that we need to prevent to happen because of the uh, monitoring of the uh, situation on the ground. We are afraid that there might be uh, emergence of what we call juvenile suicide terrorism, which is the involvement of children and young people in suicide attacks and lone wolf suicide terrorist at attack, which aims to pursue what we call martyrdom operation from jihad to uh, shahid. And then uh, 
suicide terrorism has become the most prevalent means of violent attacks by pro-ISIS elements in the Philippines four years after uh, the Marawi liberation. Suicide terrorism was initially perpetrated by foreign nationals, like in the case of Lamitan Hulo Cathedral in Indanan bombings, then followed eventually by Filipino suicide bombers, like in the case of Indanan and Hulo Twin uh, bombings. So far, all suicide terrorist attacks in the Philippines have become family affairs, thus the advent of family suicide uh, terrorism. So this is just an example of my study that I conducted about the relationship of all the suicide uh, bombers uh, out of these five suicide terrorist attacks that they are all uh, related uh, very, very closely. So I will not uh, discuss that. And then even the financing of terrorism uh, involving more and more people from the women's sector. And they're also part of the, 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 the family. And if you're also interested about the uh, historical background of suicide terrorism in the Philippines, I just uh, presented this uh, two weeks ago about Parang Sabila and Horomentado, Islam, Catholicism, and suicide terrorism in the Philippines. You can get all the full uh, copy of my presentation in the website of the Philippine Studies Association. So what are the lessons that uh, we can learn 20 years after 9-1? when we talk about terrorist threats in the Philippines. So uh, terrorist threats in the Philippines 20 years after 9-1-1, we learned that you know, they are adaptive and resilient to the new situations. So I think uh, having a technical issue. Let's see how their capability okay. to adapt to the new situation. They are also persistent. And the threats of terrorism in the Philippines is so complex because they are in mesh. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. So complex because it's being in mesh. Uh, Romel, sorry. Uh, perhaps you want to continue with your camera off because uh, having some issues, it might be easier if you continue with your camera off. Apologies for that. Uh, Roman, can you hear me? Can you, can you see now my slide? Uh, okay, I can hear you. Okay, uh, your slides are coming. Okay, I think you continue with your camera off for now. Okay, uh, what have you missed? Uh, you can start from here, actually. Yep, lessons okay. learned. So what lessons learned 20 years after 911? So these are the lessons we learned after 911. The terrorist threats in the Philippines are adaptive and resilient to the new situation. And this is also related with the second uh, lesson that they are persistent and evolving, especially in the context of crime terrorism nexus. It is also complex because uh, threats of terrorism in the Philippines are enmeshed in many other issues like uh, internal insurgency, warlordism, banditry, local political dynamics, clan wars, or redo, and even vested interests. And more importantly, the great lessons that we learned from uh, terrorist threats in the Philippines, the threats run in the family. They run in the family. So this is a, uh, a, an example of the study that I am doing. And uh, my, my intention was to publish this this year, but uh, uh, I cannot beat my deadline. That the, that the Abu Sayyab group particularly has evolved uh, from banditry to terrorism to crime terrorism nexus. So they have all, also experienced several waves of terror. And now we are experiencing a new wave of terror, especially in the context of the return of the Taliban. And if you will also see from 1989 to 2020, the Abu Sayyab group uh, can easily pledge their allegiance from Al-Qaeda to ISIS. So now we are monitoring how, how the Abu Sayyab group will behave in the, uh, during the return of the Taliban in Afghanistan. So uh, this is the crime terrorism nexus, and we have examined this during the Marawi siege, where all types of transnational organized crimes uh, were at play during the Marawi siege. And also multiple and complex issues because terrorism in the Philippines is also associated with a lot of issues like poverty, greed, power, 
clan feuds, personal vendetta, injustice, and even pure insanity by some personalities, and uh, some also uh, uh, encouraged by uh, ideology. And also multiple players and personalities that are associated with criminals, insurgents, armed smugglers, kidnappers, illegal liars, drug traffickers, extortionists, scalawags, and uniforms, okay? warlords, and even corrupt politicians. Okay? And uh, these are all involved in what I call violent entrepreneurs. You know, they are, they are making uh, money out of uh, these uh, violent activities. And uh, they also run in the family, uh, especially uh, in the context of the Maote group. So 20 years after 9-1-1 and four years after the Marawi liberation, terrorist threats in the Philippines continue to come from the following armed groups, Abu Sayyab group, remnants of the Maoti group now being led by Abu Sakarya, that's why I'm calling it Abu Sakarya group. Then of course, Bank Samoa Islamic Freedom Fighters still uh, factionalized into three, but I am paying more attention to a group being led by Abu Toraipe or the Toraipe group. Then remnants of Ansar Khalifa Philippines now being led by the Nilong group. Uh, and then a new shadow week group called the San Salhoudin group. Then followers of Suyuful Kilapa Filuson composed mainly of um, Muslim converts, not only from from Luzon and Visayas, but also uh, in Mindanao and even involvement of foreign terrorist fighters. So um, when it comes to local terrorist groups, they are called Dawliya Islamiya groups in Mindanao. Okay. In Basilan, we have the one being headed by uh, uh, Janatul, although I am receiving reports that uh, Purudyo Indama in Basilan may still be alive. Then Mundi Sawadjaan in Sulu leading the group there after the death of Ajan Sawadjaan. Then we have the Abu Sakarya. Uh, in uh, Lanao provinces, then Abu Turaipe, Magid group in the uh, Sok Sargent area, and now the shadowy Salahuddin uh, Hassan group uh, being headed by uh, Salahuddin Hassan, which I will discuss later on. So Abu Sayyab group, we always pay attention to Mundi Sawadjaan right now because he's responsible for a series of suicide terrorist attacks in the Philippines. But for me, the most dangerous person there is uh, Ben Tatu, you know, more, more, more violent and, you know, more more uh, bolder, bolder in activities. So these are the picture of Ben Tato. Then uh, the remnants of Maoti group being led now by German Bantas or Abu Sakarya. You know, this, uh, he is the successor of the Maoti brothers and Abu Dar. Then uh, this is Abu Sakarya. And the good thing, uh, the, the interesting thing about Abu Sakarya is that he is the nephew of uh, former vice chairman of MILF for military affairs, uh, Abdul Aziz Mim Bantas, you know. So that's the, and they are also related with the Maote family. Uh, they are all uh, related because of uh, marriages, okay, okay. And most importantly, uh, the connection of, uh, of uh, Imam Bimbentas with the Maote family. So terrorism runs in the family. And this is the latest activity uh, involving Abu Sakarya, uh, uh, indicating that he, he was planning for some uh, violent activities, uh, especially after the Ramadan. So he made a display of these uh, followers uh, with increased number of uh, young people and women in, in the group. And also uh, telling them to continue their jihad and following the footsteps of their, of their uh, shahid, of their uh, leaders. Okay. And this is the, one of the footages that I got from their latest video. Okay. And uh, also a report from, uh, from uh, ISIS Central, uh, ISIS Media Group, indicating that the remnants of Maoti Group continues to be, they continue to be active okay, in Lanao uh, provinces. Then the Bank Samoa Islamic Freedom Fighters, uh, factionalized into three, but uh, uh, I'm, I pay more attention to the Raipi Group. Okay, operating mainly in SPMS box. Uh, the SPMS box rep uh, represents the uh, four major municipalities in Maguindanao that are in fact being controlled by uh, the group of Paturaipe. Uh, then we have the Ansar Khalifa Philippines now being headed by the, the Nilong uh, brothers in uh, the Sargent area. Then the Hassan Salahuddin group is the only group that pledge allegiance to uh, to uh, Al Qurashi. Okay? And uh, in the interesting information about uh, Salahuddin is that uh, he was trained by uh, Marwan and uh, Basit Usman. Okay? So then Sio Paul Kilapa Piloson, uh, Muslim converts. And interestingly also, the Abu Dar is mimicking the, 
the face of uh, Abu Musab al sarkawi Why I am using uh, the picture of Abu uh, Musab al sarkawi Because Abu Musab al sarkawi is the founder of Jama'al al tawhid wal-Jihad, which is the forerunner of ISIS. But in the Philippines, the Suyupol Kilapa Pilosan is claiming itself to be part of Jawal al tawhid wal-Jihad Philippines. So that's the relationship. Okay. Okay. And most of their members are in fact uh, uh, associated with the Raha Sulaiman Islamic Movement. Okay. Then also the involvement of foreign terrorist fighters, they go to the Philippines because they regard the southern Philippines as the new land of jihad, it's a safe haven and alternative home base. And we can uh, prove that with the identified bodies of foreign terrorists right after the Marawi liberation. So there can be more there. And even in the structure of Daulay Islamiyah Wilayatul Masriq, foreign terrorist fighters play a vital role in the entire organization of Daulay uh, Islamiyah uh, Wilayatul Masriq or Islamic State uh, East Asia province. Okay, and these are the uh, backdoor routes okay, that they utilize in order to enter the Southern Philippines. Okay. And then, uh, of course, uh, they, 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 they operate not only in the southern Philippines, but they also operate in Sabah. And this is just an example of the recent arrest of uh, Abu Sayyaf group uh, fighters in uh, Sabah last month. So what are future prospects, uh, particularly uh, identifying persistent and emerging threats uh, in the Philippines? So these are the persistent threats, aviation terrorism, the use of drone, because they use drone during the Marawi siege. Then of course, maritime terrorism, we already experienced that during the Super, 44, Super Ferry 14 bombing in 2004. Then the use of car bombs, very, very uh, frequent uh, in the Southern Philippines. But we need to uh, monitor now the possible use of animal bombs and lone wolf suicide terrorism. Okay. Not so much about WMD terrorism, but uh, we still need to monitor that aspect. Okay. But I'm more interested to, uh, uh, examine the and also prevent the possible rise of juvenile terrorism in the Philippines and lone wolf terrorism, considering that more and more younger people are getting involved in, uh, in, in radicalization. This is just an example of the pictures being suspected of uh, being um, uh, possible suicide bomber. You know, these are the, the, the children of the Hulu Cathedral bombers uh, uh, in Indonesia. CC was already arrested. Okay. 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 And then this is the uh, latest uh, arrest that took place uh, last February okay, uh, with the involvement of women and uh, children being suspected of uh, being trained in uh, suicide terrorist missions. And the latest picture that I got uh, uh, indicating that the fighters on the ground are becoming uh, younger. Okay. Just, just, uh, just an example. Okay. So four years after Marawi liberation, the, the threats of terrorism in the Philippines, especially those pro-Islamic uh, uh, states group, are operationally down, but not totally defeated. It is attempting to rise again, especially in the context of the return of the uh, Taliban in Afghanistan and the attack of uh, Islamic State Khorasan in Kabul uh, airport uh, this week. They are severely broken, but not really dissolved because they are resolved to wreak havoc even during the COVID-19 pandemic and even beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. They are wounded, but not dead. It is struggling to survive. They are weak, but can still mount very strong violent attacks as demonstrated by five suicide terrorist attacks that uh, conducted. And just uh, uh, last week, uh, another roadside bombing uh, uh, took place in uh, Basilan, almost the same place of the suicide uh, bombing uh, uh, location perpetrated by a uh, German national with a Moroccan descent. Then they are smaller in size, but they can still create big trouble. Its current size and logistics are deficient, but threats that they pose are arguably evolving and persistent. And the uh, success of the Marawi, Marawi re, uh, rehabilitation can contribute to the countering of terrorist threats in the Philippines. However, dissatisfactions coming from the recipients of Marawi rehabilitation uh, programs can also fuel another form of discontents that can encourage people to commit acts of terrorism. So to counter this stress, the Philippine government passed last year the, the anti-terrorism law of 2020 and uh, currently implementing the 
2019 National Action Plan to counter and prevent violent extremism. However, in my observation, there's still a great need to strengthen community-based approach and private sector participation in order to really counter comprehensively the current persistent and emerging terrorist threats in the Philippines. On the part of the armed forces of the Philippines, they are implementing this great program. It's called Broad Reforms in Addressing Violent Extremism that aims to strengthen community uh, participation. So uh, they are gaining some achievements, uh, but uh, I'm interested to know whether they can sustain their current efforts. And also the paid concept being implemented in uh, Basilan, it's called the Prevent uh, Prevention Against Violent Extremism, uh, emphasizing the need for uh, community participation, especially engagement of youth, women, and religious sector in the process. So uh, uh, it is currently being implemented in uh, Basilan. And also the issue of Bangsamora Transition Authority. Now they are seeking for uh, uh, extension of the transition uh, period. Uh, there are, of course, feeling of uh, uh, dissatisfaction about the performance of the Bangsamora Transition uh, Authority. But the success and failure of Bangsamora Transition Authority uh, will also determine the future direct the future direction of terrorist threats in the Philippines, particularly in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in uh, Muslim Mindanao. And also the takeover of the Taliban in Afghanistan can also resonate in the southern Philippines, considering, considering that the uh, Islamic State Khorasan has a very strong relationship with the Islamic State East Asia. You know, money that funded the Marawi siege uh, came from ISIS Central, and ISIS Central uh, course the money through ISIS Khorasan. Okay. So Marawi siege was funded. Of course, you know, these personalities that, that received the money, okay, okay, uh, from Malaysian. Of course, you know, the Saifula who played a vital role, believed to be in Afghanistan, but also there are issues that uh, he might have been killed in the drone attack by uh, uh, the United States, but uh, he is a person to, uh, to examine also Saifula. Okay. And uh, uh, Saifula was also suspected of bombing, uh, funding the Hulu Cathedral bombing through its associate uh, Andy Baso, who is the husband of uh, Sisi, okay, technically the, the son-in-laws of the two uh, suicide bombers uh, in Hulu Cathedral. Okay. And they use this uh, telegram. Uh, Telegram and Western Union to uh, to deliver money to the Southern Philippines. So the return of the Islamic Emirate will it affect the situation in the Southern Philippines? We don't know yet. But this is very interesting. I I, I encountered this website. It's called Islamic Emirate of the Philippines. You know, and I reported this website to uh, concerned authorities for monitoring. But when I visited it last night, it was already frozen. So. Uh, so uh, we don't know who, who are these people behind the creation of this web website, Islamic Emirate of the Philippines. We don't know if this is pro-ISIS, pro-Al-Qaeda, or pro-Taliban. But through this web website, it tells me that threats of terrorism in the Philippines persist and can evolve. That's all for now. Thank you very much. And sorry for being fast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Romel, in fact, uh, it's, it's good that you are able to carry on a uh, very relief. <laughs> uh, in fact, during the uh, discussion session, you can turn on your video as well. Uh, right now, I'd like to uh, pass the time over to uh, Yusuf Morales, please. So, Yusuf, uh, please, uh, you can have a presentation now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Kumar. Um, uh, thank you very much also, Dr. Romel Banlawi. Um, I'll I'll put the disclaimer first before I start opening my discussion right now. The my my bias is I am a community development worker as well as a peace builder, so the discussion that I would be highlighting would be coming from that lens. Although previously I have been working with, uh, with the academia and the government trying to address the context of violent extremism, so I would try to dovetail my discussion with Dr. Banlawi's discussion and would try to skip some areas where he has previously this, uh, uh, opened up. So I'd like to 
uh, start uh, my context with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning to everyone. Magandang uh, umaga. Uh, four years after Marawi, what happened and uh, what do we uh, face at this uh, current juncture? Uh, my discussion would highlight on four points. First is I'll try to put a basic framework or context and then what has happened from the battle at the narrative phase as well as what we are now in the current context because four years after Marawi, something happened outside of the Philippines which is being connected both philosophically, politically, and ideologically by some groups, and then what do we do afterwards, uh, knowing all of these contexts, and dovetailing it with the previous discussion of Dr. Banlawi. Okay, next, um, hold on. I think I have a technical... So in May 2020, the Philippines presented the report on the measures to eliminate international terrorism to the United Nations General Assembly in response to Resolution Number 74194 of the General Assembly, to, which is the Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022, which incorporated the ATC Resolution Number 38, Section 2019 which actually was the National Action Plan to Prevent and Counter Violent Extremism. This actually was a whole-of-nation approach which they initiated in order to capacitate the different government agencies, uh, institutions, in the development of PCVE strategies. Uh, however, combating threats to peace and security has always been a major concern for any country. The Philippines is not immune to such a threat, considering that it has been included in the top 10 countries that has been in the Global Terrorism Index for the year 2020. Now, of course, we understand that in, in May of 20, uh, six, uh, 2017, a major incident happened, which is the Marawi Siege. Now, the Marawi Siege tested the government's understanding of how to bring all government agencies together to address the looming threat of violent extremism. So as we see, uh, in 2017 of October, uh, October 23 of 2017, wh while the Marawi siege was officially ended, uh, the government still had to address many different concerns such as the rehabilitation of the city where one of the biggest battles in Southeast Asia has happened for quite a very long time, which is the Marawi siege, wherein uh, government, civil society, not only tried to rebuild Marawi, but much of the focus was trying to address the social anger that was building up among the residents. Of course, uh, in 2019 to 2020, uh, many of the issues that they have tried to address was through the implementation of the different capacity building programs on the ground uh, in, Marawi C in, in Marawi City and in other areas of Mindanao. Because uh, in order to address social anger that has happened in Marawi, they have to also address the other component cities and communities in Mindanao and in the Philippines in general to prevent a repeat of Marawi siege. Now, basically, Marawi was a battle of narratives. It was a battle of, while the civilian population of Marawi was bombarded with, uh, with the battle between two major camps physically, there was also a battle between two camps trying to sell their, their narrative in order to gain legitimacy over the city. So the IS militants tried to present their ideology of Islam, which uh, was the reason, they are saying that the reason for conquering Marawi, for setting up an Islamic state in Marawi, was primarily to save the people from uh, the deviated norms of, of Kufur, as well as trying to return them under the banner of Islam. On the other hand, the government was uh, showing an argument that uh, that Daesh, 
the local Daesh uh, affiliates were actually uh, presenting a wrong perspective of Islam. And in the middle, uh, the civilian population of Marawi tried to evade both factions and just try to get out of Marawi as soon as possible. But because of the uh, physical and the communications battle that happened, people uh, around Mindanao, specifically cities that are connected uh, economically and socially to Marawi, has felt the implications of this battle. It has created a level of uncertainty and it has created a level of unhappiness because uh, as Dr. Banlawi has mentioned in his slide, um, there were some unaddressed issues in the rehabilitation of Marawi and up to now, uh, residents are unable to rebuild back their lives because of the unexploded ordinances as claimed by the AFP as well as uh, the reconstruction efforts. With these battles going on, uh, even after Marawi siege ended, the Daesh affiliated militants have claimed that they were successful, that they were successful in providing martyrs and they were successful because they have proven the government was wrong and has failed to rehabilitate Marawi and has failed in giving a better life for the Muslims in Mindanao. So on one end, while the Daesh militants uh, belonging to the cyber caliphate was claiming this propaganda, the government on the other side was also claiming it has succeeded in ending the Marawi invasion or Marawi siege and they have liberated Marawi and that they have in order to ensure that the militants won't be able to reconquer, recontrol any city again in the Philippines have engaged in a series of efforts to prevent it from happening. Now, I'd like to highlight some of the backstories that has happened while Mara before Marawi, while Marawi was happening and after Marawi happened. Okay. Um there there are some two anecdotes that we came across while Marawi after the incident in Marawi, wherein there were two professional individuals, businessmen and professionals, coming from uh, North Cotabato and General Santos. These are non-Muslims. Two years before the Marawi siege, they embraced Islam, but privately, not uh, but keeping it private, not mentioning it to the family, while they attended certain activities, orientation, and perhaps radicalization activities that prepared them for mobilization. When the Marawi siege was about to happen, these two individuals asked permission from their families uh, turned over their businesses and simply disappeared without a trace. When Marawi siege was happening, they received some cryptic uh, SMS messages ask, giving them instructions on what to do when, uh, when something bad happens. And after Marawi siege happened, uh, some of the uh, bodies, the, corp the, the bodies of these uh, uh, Maute or uh, Daesh affiliated fighters were returned to their families and the families of these two professionals from North Cotabato and General Santos were surprised when they received the, the bodies of their uh, of their, of their uh, Padre de Familia the head of the family wrapped in white cloth with instructions to bury it in a Muslim cemetery so with this as a backstory, it only shows that the impact of the Marawi siege was not simply felt by uh, the people of Marawi and the cities that are connected to Marawi like Iligan, Cagayan de Oro, Tugaya, and other uh, municipalities in Lano del Sur, Lano del Norte, and in the Misamis area, but also in other areas where converts coming from other areas tried to go to Marawi to fight. And as a result, their families didn't have closure. And some of these families didn't even know that their families, uh, that, their re that their relatives became Muslims, which created a sense of social anger. And the implications are tremendous. Now, 
of course, before Marawi happened, the government was actually initiating a series of whole of nation approaches which started from the IPSP Bayanihan which transcended towards the DSSP Kapayapaan which was implemented during the time of President Duterte which tried to call together all uh, sectors to collaborate and address issues that would cause people to engage in violence and violent extremism. Now, four years after Marawi siege, the major question is what do we have to address and prevent a return to Marawi? Well, of course, I'd like to show some of the narratives that has been uh, going on before Marawi, during Marawi, and post-Marawi, wherein the legitimacy of Daesh militants has been questioned using uh, messages coming from the moderate religious groups, from moderate public intellectuals, as well as key opinion makers. Now, we are now at this important juncture, four years after Marawi, what is happening? It is crucial to mention that when Marawi happened, uh, it presented the concrete experiences of previous terrorist incidents capsulated in a city, in a city that is placed in one of the Catholic countries around the world. Now, when when the Taliban reconquered after 20 years, it presented a series of uh, dilemma to Muslims in the Philippines because it created three factions in the Philippines. Those who were actively supporting it, those who were silently supporting it, and those who were uh, opposed to it because of the implications that tal of what Taliban is. Now, we have to uh, highlight that when the Taliban achieved power in the Philippines, if you observe social media, a lot of congratulatory messages came out from the different sectors of Muslim society, from the extremists towards community development workers, because it presented different messages. First is uh, the success of the right to self-determination of the Afghan people, which is uh, any, uh, any liberation movement would relate with, with, like the MNLF and the MILF. Um, anti-imperialism because when the United States and its allies left uh, Afghanistan, revolutionary movements around the world like the CPP, NPA, NDF as well as the Maoist movements internationally celebrated the, the, the abandonment of Afghanistan by the US and its allied forces. And thirdly, by those who profess similar ideological uh, orientation such as uh, jihadi groups around the world who were celebrating the success of the Taliban and therefore it sends a similar message that we can do it here in our country and it was also the expression on social media of some groups as was presented previously by Dr. Banlawi that if the Taliban did it after 20 years then we can do it hence the creation of some websites like the Islamic Emirate of the Philippines, which was presented previously. Now, what would have been the Philippine government response four years after? We have previously mentioned the IPSP Bayanihan and the DSSP Kapayapaan, which is, basic, which is a, a, in essence, a community-centric approach. Now, there are two PCVE programs being implemented by the government. The first is the National Action Plan to prevent and counter violent extremism which addresses the religiously oriented militants those who use religion as an ideology which is represented by the Daesh affiliated groups the second is uh, the NTF LCAC which addresses the political ideology gro uh, ideological groups which operate in the Philippines which is represented by the CPP, NPA, NDF. So both of these programs try to address four major areas. 
First is the areas of influence or the sectors where radicalization would happen. Second, it tries to address the causes of social anger and hate, which is actually the issues being used by these two uh, groups, the black flag and the red flag in the Philippines, to recruit. The third is to ensure that the community welcomes those who would decide to change new lives. So this is where the radicalization and rehabilitation happens. And the fourth is to ensure all of the stakeholders or the community would make sure that no one gets left again. No one gets left again and would join militant groups. So the, in theory, this is the, the aims of both the National Action Plan to prevent countering violent extremism and the NTFLK. Basically, the whole of community approach or the whole of nation approach was also used uh, just to highlight even in the addressing of the COVID pandemic. So in a way, the whole of nation approach is the uh, all-out mechanism used by the Philippine government to address different uh, threats to law and order, peace and security, as well as the COVID pandemic. Now, what do we do at this important juncture, considering that we have discussed previously from the discussions of Dr. Romel and this presentation. What do we do now and what are the lessons learned four years after Marawi has happened and now that there is a resurgence of, of the Taliban in Afghanistan? One of the interesting uh, things that we have observed that we should, data should be considered gold. One of the uh, biases of researchers is that they only tend to go in one area of research or one one sector meaning when one does research in social media they uh, PCV sometimes they tend to focus on social media or strategic communications we must understand that data wherever it is taken should be considered gold and should be considered treated uh, allow me to give you an example uh, when the Marawi siege happened uh, most of the people were trying to read what social media posts were. Some of them were trying to do into encrypted social media such as Telegram, WhatsApp, and Viber. But what they did not observe was the movement of people. Uh, from where the movement of people came in six months before the Marawi siege and what were the incidents that caused these people to move. So data should be considered gold because wherever you take this data, they all present you a unified picture of what is actually happening on the ground. Whether this is coming from uh, social media, two-way radio, key opinion forums, all of this would be consolidated to present a bigger picture. Second is partner or perish. In doing PCVE programs, you cannot be an island. Everyone should have a stake. Everyone should have a role. When we try to do research in order to understand the picture, it is important for us to engage all stakeholders because each stakeholder has a piece of data available to them that can be consolidated to show the bigger picture. And lastly, what is important is all stakeholders should have to put their cards on the table, meaning all data should be available as much as possible in order for national policy planners uh, on the strategic level, regional operational managers who would try to look at it at a tactical level, as well as on the ground government and civil society operators who, do, who actually uh, engage with them on an operational level. So with that, I hope um, we, have, we have managed to present a compressed picture of it and apologies if we have gone beyond the t uh, time period. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, and uh, back to you. Assalamu alaikum, magandang tanghali, and good morning to everyone. And a shout out to our friends who have attended um, this forum. Thank you very much for attending the forum. Thank you very much, uh, Yusuf uh, and uh, Romel. You know, this is one of those uh, webinars where the questions, uh, I don't even have to ask people to put the questions in the chat. They start, started coming in before you guys even finished. Uh, there have been a lot of questions, very good questions. Uh, I'll get the ball rolling by trolling through. I, in fact, I've been trolling through some of these questions. So maybe to start off, I'll ask uh, Romel and uh, Yusuf, can you give us uh, your both your views of a very key question here? What are the primary drivers of radicalization 
into violent Islamic extremism uh, in the southern Philippines, you know. In fact, there's this questioner who was saying that, you know, is there a difference between the narrative of the local groups, the local insurgents? Is it different from the narrative of the foreign terrorists? I mean, that's something for you to think about as one. Second question uh, for now is, uh, which is from the, 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 the list as well, what is the degree of international links between the local threat groups in the Philippines. I mean, we all know that uh, for, for Abu Sayyaf, for example, for a few decades, have already had uh, strong links with international terrorist groups. Uh, principally in the past, it was uh, Al-Qaeda, right? Uh, but what about now? What is the degree of international links? Are local groups getting online training, for example, through social media? I mean, what is the, the, the links like? What are the links like? And uh, as part of this, are there foreign terrorist fighters still in the uh, southern Philippines? So we will start with that. Uh, Romel, perhaps you go, go first. Ah, he's frozen. <laughs> Romel, can you hear me? Thank you. Okay. So the, the art, yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? So yes. I'll just uh, take off my, yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. So uh, there sure. are basically three. Romel, well, can't hear you clearly. Please, uh, maybe switch off your camera. Drivers. Uh, Romel, well, can't hear you. Can you switch off your camera? We'll just go by audio for you. Instead of drivers of radicalization, I would like to call it drivers of... So uh, when you talk about drivers, and it's rather than drivers... Yes. Okay. Yes. Carry on. Okay. Because... Uh, my two kids are also having their online classes, so we're competing with internet oh, connection. No. Okay, so um, first, uh, instead of calling it drivers of uh, radicalization, I would like to call it uh, uh, drivers of violence. Okay. okay. Uh, and there are two drivers of violence. Yeah. Hello. Uh, can I, Yusuf, go, go ahead first while I'll fix my internet connection. I'll just okay, help. Perhaps, yeah, go ahead, Yusuf. Yusuf. Okay. No problem. Also, Yusuf, you are muted. Yusuf, you are, you are muted. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Romel. So, I would look at it at several angles because um, drivers or, or the, we always use drivers to radicalization, doors to radicalization, or pathways to radicalization. Let's, I'm going to use the term reference points. To radicalization okay so there are several reference points to radicalization because there is no single path to radicalization the first is there are of course those that are internal factors that um, that drive a person towards radicalization for example his family his friends his internal problems which may cause him to be more easily attracted to an idea that uh, that gives him meaning. The second is, of course, the external factors, which is, of course, uh, the political, economic, and social circumstances that may uh, drive him into radicalization. But, of course, this presents um, uh, an irony because a lot of those who are in violent extremism, specifically from Europe or in America, do not come from impoverished backgrounds. In fact, uh, I'll give you an example. For, ex uh, uh, for instance, the founder of the CPP-NPA, uh, Jose Maria Sison, comes from the landed class. As well, if you look at the, the Mounte family, they come from a well-off family. So in a way, in essence, what we are saying is, even though socio-economic, the, the, it does, poverty is not the only driving factor. Sometimes it is the quest for meaning. Sometimes it is ideological. Sometimes it is family. Sometimes it is uh, social connections. And at other times it is engagements. Because if you look at it, without engagement, whether this is physical physical engagement, man, person to person, or this is online, which is through social media, or this is through books, 
then a person becomes radicalized. It is always channels. Radicalization happens because there are channels to radicalization that allows a person to connect and seek meaning. When this channel provides him meaning, then it, uh, it radicalizes a person, it mobilizes a person, and eventually allows him to conduct acts of violence or provide financial support to those engaging in violent extremism because not everyone would engage in violent extremism right. there are those who would only provide financial support because from a theological perspective theological extremist perspective he who provides the weapon also earns in the reward of those who gain martyrdom so uh, this is the theological extremist explanation not the explanation of the moderate Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jamaah who condemns these activities. So, yeah. sure, uh, I hope uh, I have managed to answer yep, that's very back to you, Prof. Kumar and Dr. Romel. Yeah, Romel. Thank you. Now, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, very, very good. Very good. Uh, I'm using my mobile phone now. Okay, regarding the first question on the drivers, I identify two major drivers, uh, not of radicalization, but of violence whether violence is motivated by radicalization or extremism. And uh, two major drivers are what I call uh, relative deprivation and rising expectations. And these two major drivers propel the feeling of either injustices or even vanity of people involved in violence, especially acts of terrorism. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, because some, some are even motivated by vanity. And as you will see in my slide, I identified many other uh, uh, issues. You know, they are in mesh with each other. That's why it's complex, you know, because they're all interrelated. Uh, they reinforce each other. Then the question about foreign terrorist fighters. Yeah, from the very start, you know, uh, foreign terrorist fighters play a vital role in encouraging people in the Philippines to commit acts of terrorism. You know, already during the 1990s, uh, I mean, not even during the 90s, during the Afghan war, you know, uh, many Filipino Muslims went to Afghanistan to fight, yeah, to fight the, to, to fight the Soviet. And then um, uh, most of them, you know, they are considered Afghan war veterans. And some of them are still alive. You know, uh, I know 200 of them uh, are still alive and they felt good that the Taliban are uh, back. But in the 1990s, foreign terrorist fighters played a vital role in the uh, creation of Abu Sayyaf group, you know, Muhammad Jamal Khalifa. And even uh, Ramsey Yosef was in the Philippines to uh, plan the 911 attacks. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was uh, uh, in the Philippines. And during the ISIS era, foreign terrorist fighters also encouraged them to... Uh, pledge allegiance to ISIS, you know, the Malaysian foreign terrorist fighters and Indonesian foreign terrorist fighters. So uh, they are not only coming from Indonesia, Malaysia, and even Syria, they are coming from uh, different parts of the world. And if you will uh, examine the profile of foreign terrorist fighters uh, who died during the Marawi siege, uh, they came from different nationalities, even Europeans uh, uh, were there. So uh, foreign terrorist fighters uh, contribute to the uh, acts of terrorism in the Philippines. So what's the second question? Uh, uh, was, tomorrow yeah, I missed the second question. That, that was essentially it, yeah. Uh, I don't yeah, know okay. Yusuf, uh, thanks, Rama. I don't know, Yusuf, you okay. want to say anything about the international links of local groups in the Philippines with international organizations or... I think you're happy with what Romel has said. You agree with what he said. I think my 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 Zoom. I'll first you. Uh, I'll focus more on the narratives, while Dr. Romel would focus on on sure. the military yeah. and intelligence aspect. Now, I'll try to highlight that wherever militants are, the I mean the Islamic militants. Uh, they, it has always been uh, the general narrative has been kufur versus iman faith versus uh, belief uh, black versus white and therefore they would always try to look internationally for areas where this is happening uh, let's say for example in the case of china that would be the uyghur uh, concentration camps now in the philippines 
um, as uh, because of the Mindanao issue, it, this always gets recycled every time. And you have to understand that the Philippines has has always been uh, proud to say that they are the only Catholic Christian country in Asia, which prevent uh, which presents a challenge to IS militants. Because if you look at it, the narrative of the Crusades comes in wherein they will try to recover. And I remember, you, you remember uh, Dr. Rommel that uh, part of the discussions in the earlier phases, diba, they are saying the Balik Islam want to recover the Philippines from Christianity and make it Muslim again. Kaya nga yung polit Balik Islam had become a political term, an ideological term the return to Islam. And that has been the byline here. While the international byline has been return to Islam, return to the correct interpretation of Islam, the local byline was you were Muslim before you returned to Islam. You returned to your correct understanding of Islam, to the Islam of the, they use the word Salaf. Although the term Salaf is the, the, the primary foundational founders of Islam, uh, which is actually different from what these extremists are presenting, but they are using that key word. Now, so from an ideological, from a narrative perspective, there are always lines that intersect and connect them. And it is impossible for the local affiliates to operate without either ideological, political, or even um, logistical guidance coming from whoever is the main purveyor of violent extremism, Islamist violent extremism. Before it was Al-Qaeda, and I think now um, it's the Daesh, the Daula Islamiyah, which has several, as presented by the slide of Dr. Banlawi. But because the Taliban has resurfaced again, Taliban being one of the main uh, uh, political partners of Al-Qaeda, then I think there is going to be another level of um, of ideological underpinning, considering that the first um, ex uh, first group that has used narcotics as a form of warfare was actually Al Qaeda, because right. it 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 used it to boost its fina its finances, it legitimized the use of narcotics to be funneled in to be able to operate. The implications to the Philippines are tremendous, as presented previously by Dr. Banlawi, the, the narco-terrorism nexus, because they provided the ideological basis. So, from a narrative side, there are links. From the logistical, intelligence, military side, I believe Dr. Banlawi can best elucidate on that. Yeah, you guys are very complimentary. Yeah, both of you are very complimentary. In fact, this leads us to, I guess, a very significant question which has popped up anyway as well in the chat. You know, you look at, for example, Indonesia, right? The response to the Taliban victory, uh, let's call it that, in Kabul, has been diverse. Well, I mean, it's not identical. For example, those groups that are pro-Al-Qaeda, like JI, uh, Jama'a Anshu Sharia, they are more uh, positive, right? Whereas the pro-ISIS groups, not all the pro-ISIS groups like JAD in Indonesia or East Indonesian Mujahideen, they are not so uh, effusive, if you like, because they are more pro-ISIS. And we do know that, at least in Afghanistan, the Taliban and ISIS Khorasan are fighting each other. But in the Philippines, I mean, just now, I think, uh, Romel, you are saying that, uh, you know, we are still monitoring the response, right, of the Abu Sayyaf group to the Taliban uh, situation and perhaps I'd like to have uh, your views, uh, both Yusuf and uh, Romel. What do you think would be the response in, uh, of the groups, chat groups in the Philipp southern Philippines? Uh, number one, are these how do they see the Taliban victory on social media, which you can say? Number two, do you think that this will also raise the level of threat within the uh, southern Philippines, but also to the region? I think this is a, a key question from what you I see coming in. So, once uh, Romel, you want to go first? Well, the situation on the ground tomorrow is still very fluid, but uh, what are facts on the ground? Facts on the ground, there are still pro-ISIS elements, and those pro-ISIS elements, especially uh, uh, those responsible for the Marami siege, continue to have 
uh, allegiance or even loyalty to the Islamic State, and they continue to have links with the Islamic State Khorasan. So in the context of the Afghanistan conflict, they support the ISIS Khorasan because of the close relationship between uh, ISIS Khorasan and ISIS Wilaya uh, in, in, in the Southern Philippines. But there are also other personalities who remain to be loyal with Al-Qaeda, okay? especially with the resurgence of Jamaya Islamia in Indonesia. There are now... Um, the configurations of personalities. Uh, I, I talked to some people indicating that, you know, the network that pro-ISIS elements used in the Philippines was in fact the network that was established by Jemai Islamia, and that is the Mantiki network. Okay? And uh, pro-ISIS elements in the Philippines will not be able to mount their activities in the southern Philippines without the use of the network established by Jemai Islamia. So with the resurgence of Jemaah Islamiyah in the Philippines, there is now also a resurgence of uh, Jemaah Islamiyah followers uh, in the Philippines, particularly those coming from, uh, from uh, in Indonesia. And then also pro-Taliban, pro-Taliban personalities, especially those uh, children of the Afghan war veterans because they, 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 they Talk to them. Their their struggle in driving away the Soviets, and they finally and they and their narrative is that it's a struggle of the people for self determination. And the Taliban is like the Bangsamoro people. It's like the Moro, you know, advocating for uh, their uh, right to uh, self determination or struggling for national liberation. So these are the three major tendency tendencies that I am currently studying right now, the pro-ISIS elements, the pro-Al-Qaeda elements, particularly pro-KI elements, and the pro-Taliban elements. Thank you. What about you, Yusuf? What do you think? Um, first, I would like to highlight, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll dissect it from an ideological and a philosophical perspective. Of course, we understand that Al-Qaeda, the, the, the discussion, the, the, the debate between Al-Qaeda and, and Daesh, actually, Al-Qaeda was saying, let us first fight uh, the Kufar and deal with the, with the ideological differences later. While Daesh, the debate of Daesh when it established the, its state in, in Syria and Iraq, was saying, let's fight the Kufar and let's fight the internal deviants. That was the position of Daesh. The position of Al-Qaeda was, let's fight first the Kufar then when we're successful, Kufar is the, it, Kufar is the infidel, the, right? Yes, yes. Kufar that, is the infidel. That was the that was the major debate. Now, uh, as this progress further, we can see that in the manifestation of how, um, of course, an affiliate of of Al Qaeda, Taliban, is doing. If we look at that angle, that the Taliban immediately came out with a with a uh, declaration when they took over that they want to be an inclusive government. Yep. Okay. That means everyone is welcome. And that was why um, when they started occupying Kabul, the first thing they did was they visited a Shia Majlis that was celebrating Muharram. Now, for all points and purposes, when we look at it at face value, wow, this is good. Now, let's go on the two other angles. Okay. Now, in, in, in South Asian Islam, other than the different sectarian differences, Sunni, Shia, Ahmadi, there are two major intellectual trends in Islam in, 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 in South Asia, meaning Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. This is called, this is divided between the Barlewi intellectual heritage and the Diobandi intellectual heritage. The Barlewi intellectual heritage integrated both the pre-Islamic influences with the Islamic influence. While the Dioban movement wanted to purify Islam from non-Islamic elements. And practically, uh, majority of those who follow the Taliban came from the Diobandi ranks. Yep. Now, the Diobandi uh, intellectual tradition has a wide spectrum coming from the moderate Ahlusuna wal Jamaa. Hanafi in school uh, in jurisprudence and Maturidi in 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 ideology, running towards 
Salafi uh, interpretation. So it's a broad spectrum. Hence, you would see uh, a lot of those who were educated in South Asia or those who were influenced in South Asia to be declaring pro-Taliban positions. Congratulating the Taliban, you would see. Although you would not see uh, movements like the Jama'at Tablig congratulating it as a group, you would see individual uh, Diobandi religious scholars such as the Muftis in Pakistan congratulating it. It is because um, the Taliban actually comprises of both the Salafi elements that has come from Al-Qaeda as well as some Diobandis who joined it. Hence, um, if you look at Indonesia, in the Philippines, and even in Malaysia, and perhaps some parts there in Singapore who are influenced by the Diobandi uh, intellectual tradition to be congratulating the Taliban. Uh, that is that is primarily uh, one of the reasons. The second, which I previously mentioned, is of course those who are engaged in the fight for liberation and the right to self-determination would find the Taliban as a case example of success. And therefore, let's congratulate them and let's learn from them. So, uh, if you look at social media and you um, before the pandemic, uh, one of the things that the consortium does is we go sit in coffee shops because <laughs> in, in, in Muslim communities, that's where all of the major stories come out. And because we could not do it during the pandemic, uh, we focused more on the social media platform as well as the two-way radio because in, in down in Southern Mindanao, specifically in Lanao, in, Cent in, in Maguindanao, and even in Zamboanga, Basilan, Sulu, Tawi-Tawi, they use two-way radio as a platform for discussion because the coffee shops are closed. Although some areas, the coffee shops are open, so we still manage to get feedback from the coffee shops where both the militants and the government forces come in and it's a neutral place for them to drink coffee and argue. So I hope um, uh, I, I address that part of the question. If there are some more issues... We would be more than welcome to address things. But also, there's a lot of interest on the on the question of uh, for for both you and uh, Romel. Uh, does the Taliban victory increase the threat from the local uh, Philippine threat groups to the Philipp Philippines as well as to the region? I think that is the crux of what some of the colleagues here are asking. It is yes, and it is no, because unless the Afghan veterans and Afghan ch children of Afghan veterans would uh, request from the Taliban uh, support and the Taliban in policy decides to provide support then the threat would arise number two is um, we are now seeing the Rahbani Shura happening in Afghanistan where the, where the Taliban is calling all of its alliances abroad to come in and help them formulate a framework of governance. This happened before when the Islamic Republic of Iran was established. They called people around the world, even from the Philippines. I know of some people who attended. So the question is, who are the key people who would be attending the Rahbani Shura in Afghanistan coming from the Philippines in the light of the pandemic? So that's my major question there. So likewise, the same question could be uh, given to the different countries in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, who would be attending the, uh, the Rahbani Shura? And that would answer the primary question if the support for international revolutionary movements would happen, just in the case of Libya, Cuba, and, um, uh, and some other countries who provide support for international revolutionary movements. Thank you. Uh, Ronald, what, what about you? Uh, do you believe that the Taliban victory uh, would uh, increase the level of threat from the threat uh, Islamist groups in the Philippines and to the region as well? Well, the threat will come pre predominantly from Talibans uh, who defected to the Islamic State and tal Talibans who remain uh, loyal to the Al-Qaeda. But if you talk about Taliban's uh, who have taken over the government, they promise to pursue peaceful international relations and will not allow Afghanistan to be the breeding ground of terrorism. So uh, we take the word of the Taliban's for that. But for me, 
the greater the greater threats will come from uh, pro ISIS elements, Taliban uh, still associated with uh, uh, ISIS and Taliban associated with uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, so uh, especially the group of uh, Hassan Salahuddin, you know, and uh, the group of Mundi Sabadjaan, they are the most uh, threatening uh, leaders of the of the terrorist groups in the Philippines. So uh, that's it. And if, especially if the flow of money, you know, ISIS Khorasan uh, uh, was successful in facilitating delivery of money to the southern Philippines to mount the Marawi siege and to mount the Holo Cathedral bombing. So if they can facilitate the transfer of money, then uh, ISIS Khorasan can largely influence the uh, activities of uh, violent groups in the southern Philippines. Actually, yeah, that's, that's good. Thanks for mentioning that because there's actually a question about the terrorism financing and the, uh, the impact of the, the Taliban victory on terrorism financing. And uh, you mentioned ISIS Khorasan. Uh, uh, another op relatively uh, important question operationally, do a uh, question about the, do you see increased uh, uh, operations in the maritime space in terms of maritime terrorism. I mean, uh, there's a question here. There are so many questions. I'm trying to find it now. Uh, but Romel, I mean, you you know what I mean, right? Uh, uh, well, they they ah, they okay. they. they... There's a question. Yeah. Uh, are there indications that terrorist elements in southern Philippines have the intent to exploit the maritime domain beyond using it as an avenue to smuggle in weapons and operatives and kidnap for ransom? Uh, you know. So that's a that's an important question, quite a key question, right? Well, the maritime domain plays an important role in the violent activities of the Abu Sayyad group, particularly the Sulu Sulawesi areas, and now increasingly the Manado area, the sea uh, uh, in that area, you know, Sulu Sulawesi uh, area. So, uh, and I'm particularly referring to the activities of the Abu Sayyad group, the Tausug people. But when it comes to the activities of the uh, groups in central Mindanao, uh, they don't operate mainly in the in uh, the maritime domain. That's why if you will see the preparations of uh, armed groups in central Mindanao, they're preparing for for uh, regular warfare. But in the people in the archipelagic Mindanao, Sulu Basil and Tawi Tawi, they are now preparing for another form of warfare uh, like suicide terrorism or uh, uh, that's the kind of war, but they, they cannot do a uh, face-to-face battle with the military. And if you will also look at the, the numbers of rebel returnees, there are more and more uh, returnees uh, coming from the Sulu Basilan area because the central Mindanao area, uh, they want to do a uh, face-to-face battle with the military. And that is why the military is intensifying its uh, uh, focused military operations uh, against uh, this group. So the maritime domain is always the operational area of the Abu Sayyid group, especially those operating in Sulu and uh, Tawi-Tawi, Basilan area. You know, there's a very important question here. It kind of relates to both your presentations about the impact, the continuing impact of uh, the Marawi uh, conflict and the uh, pace of Marawi reconstruction the impact on the families affected and the potential for radicalization. So, for example, this question here is, uh, there are un undeniably lots of displaced families still from the Marawi fighting. So how are these families coping now? Uh, the, the key is, I'm, there's, uh, the siege has cultivated hate, anger, and fear uh, amongst the lo uh, locals and residents of Marawi. Hate for both the militants and the government. And if not addressed accordingly, this might result in another generation of extremists influenced by the narratives of the militants. So do you agree with this assessment? And in your view, what should the Philippine government do? So it's a question to both of you, actually. Well, I, I, I agree, Kumar. In, in fact, if you will see from the last video uploaded by, by uh, Abu Sakarya group, you know, after the Ramadan, they are showcasing disgruntled people young women, you know, children, okay, uh, preparing to mount uh, jihad because of their uh, uh, dissatisfaction with the rehabilitation. The rehabilitation, Kumar, is not uh, the main problem. The, the main problem is how the rehabilitation work 
will be distributed to the victims of the siege. You know, uh, those uh, coming from the lower section of the society in the province of La Lanao del Sur, uh, yeah, of La Lanao del Sur, they are more vulnerable for recruitment and radicalization. Okay, but the, the it's, it, it's a big it's a big issue right now, especially on uh, land issue, land issue, and land issue is in fact uh, uh, being raised not only by the poor family but even by the rich families in uh, the province of Lanao, and unfortunately the voices of the poor families are not well normally heard loudly. We, we can only hear the voices of the wealthy families in the area. So those people uh, in the depressed areas are in fact fertile ground for recruitment to become uh, fighters. Thank you. Uh, Yusuf, what is your view on this? Can't hear you. <laughs> Yusuf, yeah, you're muted. There we go again. There we go again. Okay. Um, actually, I invited uh, uh, family, uh, one of the participants coming from Marawi. So, what's important to highlight is uh, the Maranaos are one of the biggest indigenous cultural communities in the Philippines. And it comes from a very, very strong tradition of the Maranao homeland. The Maranao homeland actually uh, ranges from Lanao, the whole Lanao provinces. And Marawi is the heart of that Maranao homeland because it is where the soul of the Mar Maranao people is. Um, based on conversations, because I would like to, I would be coming from a community development worker angle. My answer would be, the, the way they are seeing is that not enough has been done to address their concerns and in fact um, a lot of my friends who are Maranaos are now based in Iligan are still are unable to come back and that funnels the narrative that was mentioned by Dr. Banlawi the uh, social justice claim of the of the IS people who are based in in southern Mindanao as well abroad the social justice issue that they are not allowed the right to return you know this is this is um this narrative actually they have taken from the nakba uh, narrative from the palestinian cause and they put it in the uh, context of Mara of the maranaos wherein they are saying you have to allow them the right to return i'd like to highlight also that before the marawi siege happened the samwanga siege happened which is a precursor of how the tactics were done in Zamboanga, the lessons learned there, and it was brought there. And there were some veterans, of, uh, and there were some fighters in Marawi that actually came from, 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 from their experiences in the Zamboanga siege, meaning those who, it was because of that anger. Um, the people who were victims of the Zamboanga siege demanded social justice. And this was used in the same framework in Marawi. So as long as that social justice narrative is not sufficiently, sufficiently addressed, the, the narrative on the side of the IS would continue to gain ground in the masses. Kasi hindi nila masagot. But it's important to highlight that we have friends who are doing psychosocial healing there in in, in in the areas uh, proximate to Marawi where the evacuees are resettled like Teach Peace, Build Peace I think Balay Mindanao I think MSU is also doing that they're trying to change perceptions but as you know perceptions can only be changed if they see tangible results on the ground they must go hand in hand so I think the government is struggling because plus the pandemic it restricts their movement to address many of the concerns but i think much is being done and i think the crucial role of the bangsamoro autonomous region in muslim mindanao comes in hand and i'd like to congratulate the congressman mujib hataman who has 
passed a bill in Congress, the Marawi Rehabilitation and Social Justice Act. I, I think that's the title. When it tries to demand compensation for the homes lost. If this bill passes through, then it's a, it's a one-touch solution that would address the concerns of the Marawi uh, victims of the siege. So, uh, each part of the government trying to address the Marawi Rehabilitation Commission has been trying to do its role. On the legislative aspect, Congressman Mujibataman has filed the bill. So, uh, the, the civil society organizations doing rehabilitation work has been doing their role. So, the question is, does the data show significant improvement in the perceptions of the people who have been affected? So that's my that's my take on it. Thank you. So, thank you. Actually, there's a related uh, quick question here about the the process of. Do you think that is uh, creating more bureaucracy, more uh, capacity building for the uh, Bangsamoro Authority? Uh, uh, will that actually is that actually the way to go? And uh, I mean, whether Romel or Yusuf, so this is one I, of the I'll let Dr. Romel answer it first, because I'll be taking in the the civil society perspective. Yeah. Yes. Well, Romel. well, right now the the problem with the um, uh, Bangsamoro Transition Authority, they felt short of time to prove that they can make a difference. You know, three years after the transition period. You know, the Bangsamoro Transition Authority failed to really make a big difference that uh, they promised to the people. So they're asking for another three-year extension, arguing that the uh, transition period given to them uh, was so short to really make a difference. And that is, in fact, generating a lot of uh, uh, dissatisfaction in what I call performance deficit of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. But there are also other groups saying that, uh, that they should not uh, extend the transition authority because you know some traditional politicians, they want to take over and hijack the whole agenda of the regional government. But uh, the good thing is that the Senate already passed a, uh, a uh, bill uh, calling for the extension of the transition because in my opinion if we will not grant the transition to the Bangsamoro Transition Authority I'm afraid that uh, some element from the MILF might resume their violent activities again so uh, that's the that's the problem now uh, uh, in the area but how about after the extension of the transition uh, period will there be a guarantee that the new Bangsamoro government will truly make a difference. Uh, uh, it's difficult to tell because there are also local political dynamics. There are traditional politicians who want to take over the, the Bangsamoro government okay, in order to hijack its original agenda and go back to the whole cycle again. You know, the same, the same, the same problems that uh, Nur Miswari and the MNLF uh, experience uh, uh, in the 1990s. So uh, I hope we can prevent that to uh, to happen again. But things are really difficult in uh, Mindanao. And for me, the Bangsamoro transition period uh, will, will not address all the complex issues uh, facing the, the region. There is no uh, simple solution. Sure. They can only tame the MILF, but they cannot solve the other uh, issues because right now in, 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 my, in my monitoring of the situation because of the performance deficit of the Bangsamoro Transition Authorities, some of their members are already joining the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters uh, mm -hmm. with the three factions, you know, some are going to Karyala, to Bungos, mm -hmm. to, uh, to Raipe. So that's, the, that's the, what I call the fragile situation in sure. the Bangsamoro region. Uh, thank, thank you for the comprehensive response. Uh, Yusuf, uh, how about you? Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, highlight that a part of, it is important that the right to self-determination of the Moro people should be addressed. 
But there's also a rising concern because inside the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao, uh, there are non-Muslim IPs who are also raising their concerns. Because there are two types, the, the Islamized peoples, which is 13 ethno-linguistic groups, and the non-Islamized, the Lumads, who have mm -hmm. been saying that I think they, there is a problem. So it presents a challenge when you create the new bureaucracies, it must also allow inclusivity. And I think um, that is a challenge, that inclusivity of including the non-Moro IP tribes as well as the non-ideologically aligned groups because the MILF represents one political ideological group. In order for the Bangsamoro Transition Authority to succeed, it must incorporate, uh, assimilate other ideologically aligned groups in in the in the region to prevent the scenario that is being discussed by Dr. Banlawi. Now that's the challenge. Um, is it happening? Uh, before I heard that there are initiatives being done to incorporate these non uh, non aligned groups, and uh, I hope it becomes successful. Now, whether or not the extension of the transition authority would be good for the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao um, is a neutral thing. We cannot say it is good, it is bad. We have to wait for the results because um, there are many well-meaning bureaucrats and technocrats who are now present uh, in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. Um, I know for a fact that some members of parliament, BTA members, who are who are progressive, who are there, who are doing their share, especially in the minority block and the non-affiliated block, they are doing their best. So the, the challenge is in the majority block on how these different, sometimes dissenting, sometimes uh, consensual, consensual opinions would be able to create uh, the necessary imagined development post the extension. Because at the end of the day, uh, the traditional politicians are waiting on the side and saying, please fail so we can come in again. So that's the, that's the byline. But I'm hoping, I'm really, really optimistic, hoping that our, our friends who are in the BARM bureaucracy uh, would do their best to ensure that does not happen. Okay. We have time for just a couple of uh, more uh uh, uh factual questions uh this may be for romel romel uh do you have uh any this is from our good friend dt alia indonesia do you have any information on aside from the, the rulis family members uh, how many uh do you have a sense of the uh, indonesian number of indonesian women who are involved in the isis philippines uh grouping uh that's one uh, final question uh is uh when you say links between ISIS Khorasan and local groups in the Philippines, uh, what do you mean? Do you mean like Telegram chat group, uh, you know, uh, an arrangement for transferring funds? Uh, can you just elaborate? Yeah, these last two questions for Romel. You know, if you look at the Southern Philippines, there are a lot of Indonesians. You know, in they, they, Southern Philippines are like the second home of many Indonesians. And uh, just go there, a lot of Indonesians. So, uh, but a few of them, with links with the Islamic State, continue to use this community uh, to uh, mount uh, violent activities and even facilitate the financing. So, uh, well, CC was arrested already. So the interrogation reports of uh, CC will give us a uh, better explanation of their whole uh, network in the in the southern Philippines. But in my opinion, I think they left behind significant followers to continue the activities of the Islamic State in the Philippines, especially with the rising activities of ISIS Khorasan in Afghanistan. And if they will promise delivery of money, which they already did, you know, uh, during the Marawi siege and during the Hulu Cathedral. Uh, uh, bombing, then uh, there will be willingness on the part of their followers in the Philippines to also to mount 
another activities. Okay. So if you will look at their activities in Sulu Basilan Tawi Tawi, what I'm uh, what I'm looking at is the rise of suicide terrorism. But when it comes to Central Mindanao, especially in Maguindanao and Lanao provinces, so uh, they are willing to undergo uh, a siege type activity, but maybe not uh, not not as large as the Marawi siege. But they have been doing that. They attempted that in Sultan Kudarat. And they attempted that in several municipalities in uh, in uh, Maguindanao. Okay, so um, if there will be flow of funds, then expect uh, uh, flow of activities in the southern Philippines. That is why it's very crucial for Philippine law enforcement authorities to uh, pursue three major tasks. One is strengthening the countering the financing of terrorism. Second is strengthening border control in the Philippines. And thirdly, enhancing intelligence gathering activities. If the law enforcement authorities can do these three major activities, the uh, level of prevention will be higher. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much uh, to my two uh, colleagues and friends, uh, uh, Romel Maloy and uh, Iso Morales. Uh, uh, we've had a very rich discussion, as I mentioned, you know, even before uh, our two speakers had finished speaking, all the questions started coming in. And uh, I, I do apologize if I, I try my best to sort of synthesize the, those questions that were seem similar and try to cover as much as I could. And I think our speakers tried as well. But uh, I mean, uh, thank I mean, thank all uh, thank all the participants for their very active uh, participation. That's really active. I really want to thank you and congratulate uh, you for uh, engaging with our speakers so well. I'd like to thank our speakers for uh, you know their excellent, uh, very in depth, very ground level uh, assessments and sharings. And uh, it's it's very very important time, of course, because. Uh, in, 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 recent, uh, in, in line of uh, recent geopolitical developments in Afghanistan and the impact certainly is being felt in Southeast Asia. And colleagues like yourselves, uh, Yusuf and uh, Romel, have uh, really helping us try to grasp and make sense of what's going on. So thank you very much and thanks to all of you as well. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, uh, the uh, chat. Uh, please, uh, participants, and in fact, uh, Yusuf and uh, as well, please check out the uh, ICPVTR Southeast Asian Militant Atlas, which is a, a dynamic and growing interactive map, which provides a consolidated visual database of ISIS and Jamaat Islamia terrorist related incidents in Southeast Asia. So the, the link is there. So I, I invite you to uh, go and take a, a look at the link. Uh, I want to ask well, whether or not, uh, uh, I mean, maybe probably uh, you can you can tell me later, uh, Yusuf and Romel, are you willing to share your slides with the participants? Because uh, there's been some uh, sure. queries on that. So uh, that, that'll be great. So with that, uh, that's all I have, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Please take a few minutes to sort of, uh, we'll really appreciate it if you can give us your feedback. There will be QR code uh, placed on the screen and you can provide your feedback on that. We really want to know uh, your, your views on uh, how you found the session and what you think we would, we should cover in a future series on uh, terrorism landscape South Asia. So with that, thank you very much and uh, have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank, thank you very much, Kumar. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very, very much, Kisar. Thank you. Bye-bye.